What is going on, everybody, and welcome back here to Pitbull Audio. Uh, today, we're bringing to you uh, with Sawtooth Guitars, Mr. Michael Angelo Badio for a live stream interview. Mike, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you? There he is. What's going on, man? I see you got a guitar in your hands. You're already shredding it up today, or what? <clears throat> yeah, we can't uh, can't leave home without it, and I'm at home, so I'm not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal that. That's a very good way to put it. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, how, how have, you know, obviously very crazy times for everybody right now. How are things going for you in studio? Are you the type of person that's just kind of dug more into work or? How are you yeah, the you know, I, I've been fortunate. Uh, you know, I, I haven't done a live show in a year like everybody else. And I was kind of upset the, the show that got canceled. I, I probably would have had a record year of touring last year. I mean, just from them, you know, the NAM show in Anaheim. Up until the beginning of March, I did almost 40 shows, maybe more, like wow. 40, 45. And then I was scheduled to play uh, as a guest with Dragon Force, sold out show at House of Blues in Chicago. Wow. And that was the show from that point on. That one got canceled. It did everything oh, else. Oh, man. That sounds Actually, like that would have been a great time. It would have been. Yeah, I know Herman pretty well. You know, Herman Leah. Yeah, it would have been ripping. But, uh, you know, I, I've been fortunate because, you know, you know, I have structural programs that are online that are pretty well known. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm able to do a lot of things. So I've been really busy, you know, no complaints. Yeah, and that's uh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. But I'm hoping to tour again. You know, we're looking uh, towards the fall and hopefully before that. So cool. All right, for anybody just joining us right now, we are now live. We have a nice live stream interview planned for you guys with Mr. Michael Angelo Badio. Of course, the uh, the legendary Shredder that's going to be with us for a little while. And at the end of this live stream, we are going to be giving away a signature guitar. Uh, I'm sorry, signed guitar uh, from uh, Sawtooth Guitars. So stay tuned for that. And at the end of it, we'll announce that winner. Um, so if you guys have any questions, we can see you guys. I see you guys coming in now. Hi, Cynthia. So we're going to see you guys. We can see your questions on the right-hand side. We're going to be pulling from that, asking him what you guys want to ask. And, of course, he'll be doing a lot of that during this whole live stream. So uh, super excited, super fun to have this thing going down. Um, so how – what – just just because – I'm also going to be throwing in some personal questions here just because we got to get sure. selfish with it sometimes. we got to ask. Uh, I, I'm a guitar player myself. What What is your practice routine like? I mean, do you just wake up in the morning – and play before you even have your first cup of coffee, or do you just now play whenever you feel like it? How's that work? No, I mean, I have uh, really, there's three practice regimens. One is when I'm on tour, and because okay. I find that uh, if you play your best stuff before you go on stage, you know, people can over rehearse before a show. And so, you know, I have really basic warm ups, and it served me well mm -hmm. because. You know, a lot of guitar players nowadays, especially, you know, the, the youngest generation of players uh, is amazing. You know, probably I think the best ever. And, and anybody who says differently hasn't listened to a guys, you know, girls. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, just the girls alone, they're just the playing field is it, even with incredible performers. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of players do is they don't start from the ground up. And so I really basic things like I just take like literally like this and then I'll go all the way to the fretboard then the next set of fingers like two one three one four and then when I get to the end then I'll do four notes per string then I'll do things like some pentatonics and blues like and so it takes about 10 minutes and if I play about a slow to medium, probably medium speed, not really fast. In about 10 minutes, I'm warmed up. Then I go over parts of songs I'm going to play in concert. That's practice regimen one. Mm. Practice regimen two uh, is that, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I do the same thing, but then I take it a lot farther. Like, uh, I'll just... But, but the rule is to start slow. And, and I mean, you know, if you think about it, you know, a race or something, you don't just turn the car on. Well, you can and do 150 miles an hour, you know, just if you warm up a little bit and, and start on the basics, it mm -hmm. really helps your hands. I mean, I've just had no hand injuries ever, knock on wood. But but part of it is because I don't over practice when I'm on tour. But when I'm recording, I'll practice an hour, two, three, four five hours before I'll even record anything. And, 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 you know, I think it's really important. Like when I do my albums, 
my rec's 13 hours of practice in a day. I don't want to play a note until I'm so dialed in. It's scary. And that's and then the third one is is mindless practice. Like you're watching a movie, the Avengers Endgame. You know what I'm right, saying? Yeah. With the guitar going, yes, Thanos sucks. You know, you know, <laughs> I am Iron Man. And I'll just sit with a guitar, literally, and just you know, it just keep the fingers moving. But but the first two are really uh, those are my main ones. But I, I'll tell you, I love to watch movies. You know, when I'm off tour, you know, especially you know if it's Marvel or you know just something you know like old funny movies. There's something about Mary, you know, just crazy stuff. And, and so, but I have a guitar. Right, right. I always have a guitar when I'm playing. You know, when I'm watching. it. So right off the bat, we've got a cool uh, got a cool question here from Alder, uh, and it says, "I heard you invented the string dampener. Uh, what other inventions have you made?" Uh, yeah, I have a patent on this. I I've come up with trademarks that I have. It, you know, it's called it's the it's intellectual property. So I have two intellectual properties attorneys. One is one of my best friends. Actually, was uh, his guitar teacher, and I didn't know he'd be, end up being in this big law firm. But like Tom Morello, you know, from Against the Machine was my student. Who knew he'd become the Tom Morello? You know, you don't know. Yeah, but, that's, uh, that's crazy. But uh, yeah, the string dampener, I got the idea playing the whole guitar because, you know, when I started doing, you know, things like this. <laughs> See, I have it on now. What happens when holding two guitars, everything that you want to play plays and everything you don't want to play sounds too. So it's just right. literally feedback. So this was the proverbial third hand. And, and I saw a crude string dampener from an American guitarist way back in the day uh, named George Van Epps, who's a jazz player. And he actually invented the seven string too. So we can create death metal and all that. He invented right. the low B7. He invented a very crude string dampener. I took his design, had an engineer redo it. And then I patented it because this, this is way different. So I, I've done this. I have trademarks like Hands Without Shadows. That's my Chinese name. Uh, I threatened patent trademark Divisible by Metal. And then I came up with, I invented the double guitar. Steve Vai gave me credit for getting the idea. There's one in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I came up with this. I came up with this wild over under thing too for live. And people, I see that a lot, yeah. Yeah, and you know, it took... I was doing this and, you know, I kept in the 80s L.A. scene, you know, the Hollywood scene in the 80s. And so um, right. nobody was doing that. I, I look like an alien when I did this. You know, it's like, what planet are you from, <laughs> bro? You know, and so uh, you know, nobody did it. It was only till the 21st century in Tom Morello. He does a slow version. You know, Herman Lee. Uh, you know, I showed it an instructional program. Nobody could even do it. Now, you know, a lot of people do it. But so, right. uh, the, you know, I wanted to be original. Uh, anybody can smash and burn a guitar. And I love to see it. But, you know, I don't think it takes talent to beat the hell of a guitar. Call me crazy. You know, you're a bad guitar. That's You've been true. very, very bad. You know, so, but I wanted to do things <laughs> that, were, that were physical. You know, I, you know, I wanted to do things that were real, like, like, uh, you know, when, when Hendrix played behind his back, I mean, say what you want or yeah. with his teeth. I mean, I like my teeth. I'm not going to do that. And, and uh, but, you know, I wanted to be original like those artists and be myself. So I came up with original things. So that's a good question. Actually, no one's ever asked me that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> cool. Started, but, started off with a banger there. Yeah. So it's practicing. Mm -hmm. Like, are you, is that something you're just doing a lot more whenever you're writing an album or you're playing? Or when you're just at home and you're not really, let's say, you know, whether you're not writing an album at the time or recording, are you still practicing all the time? Is this still, still something that's on your mind or are you just more jamming when you feel like it? Well, you know, that's a real good question because sometimes you need to put it away, you know? Uh, and I found, you know, it's something like, I, I'm not saying, mm -hmm. you know, I'm the rock or anything, you know, but, but I stay, I work out and I stay, try to stay in shape, you know, but I don't have the genetics to be like, you know, you, you know, I'm not going to be some, you know, pro wrestler or mixed martial <laughs> arts or anything. But I can tell you this, one of the things about working out 
is you can watch Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger say it. You must trick the muscle. You must trick the muscle. If you do the same thing right. every day, you're gonna, it's gonna, you're not gonna get the same returns. It's the same with playing guitar. Sometimes the best thing to do is to leave it alone. Uh, just leave it alone for a couple yeah. of days, and then you come back and you're like, the shred is strong today. You know what I mean? You you come back <laughs> and you're like, you know, they're ripping. So I, I, you're right. I, I put it down. You know, I know I'm you know I'm no rocket scientist, but I'm smart enough to know what I need to do to practice for whatever I'm practicing for. And then also, if I'm back from a tour, I'm just tired. Just leave it alone. Just put it down, not right. for too long, or else y'all suck, you know. But I mean, you know, for for a couple of days, or you know, you you have to be reasonable. But yeah, you put it away. I think it's a, a good thing to back off sometimes. Definitely, definitely, I agree with that. I think one of the modes that a lot of people fall into, and me included, is because I'm more of an online or just video creator at this point than anything else, is you start looking at it as work when it's a work involved, right? So basically, I'm not really picking up a guitar unless I'm making a video. And if I'm not making a video, I'm like, well, I'm not working as a whole. So I don't even touch the guitar because I'm not working at the time. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. Yeah, you know, I had, that's a, a, I had to wrap my head around the idea of being delivering content online. See, because you're, you're right. And see, when I practice, I usually practice for a reason, you know, and one of the reasons might be just to learn a song and get better. But that's why you have the warm up for shows, warm ups uh, for recording, and then just the mindless keep your fingers in shape kind of thing, you know, like watching a movie on a treadmill or something, you know, that kind of right, uh, yeah. analogy. Yeah, being a creator, it, it's an interesting thing because I come from that background. See, a, a video for me was like a big deal. There's a crew. Now people edit their own videos. They're so much tech savvy. Whereas I had everybody else doing it for me. Now you can right. do it yourself. And so, yeah, I found uh, exactly. it's a lot. It's a lot different. It's way different. And I really admire. Well, I mean, I've, I've seen mm -hmm. the content on your channel grow as well. Yeah, I forced myself. It's like damn, I got to look good now. You know, it's like, you know, I, you know, you know, usually I just lay around the house and I'm off tour or something. Well, now the house is the, the room is the, the, the live stream, you know, it's like right there. And so right. yeah, I kind of think in concert way and, and, uh, but it's just a very different mindset, but yeah, I had to force myself to make more content because I, I didn't grow up doing that. You know, it wasn't part of, I mean, if somebody would have told me when I was seven years old, you're going to grow up. There's a thing called the internet, and you're going to create a lot of content. I'm like, what are you talking about? I well, want to nobody rock. Nobody knew. Yeah, nobody knew that. That's what. I mean, it's not enough. I say this every live stream. It's not enough to to in our you know generation. It's not enough to be a good guitar player anymore. You have to be able to get out there and put your stuff out there. So now you have to know how to run cameras, how to edit your videos, how to upload to the internet, how to make it look you know aesthetically pleasing so that people watch it because there's a sea of them. You know, it's it's crazy. Well, you, you uh, know, Alder, we're going to circle. Go ahead. Oh, no, you're right, because I, you know, I'm a student of guitar uh, and I, right. I have a motto for myself, always a student, no matter how good I am or what I've accomplished. I always think there's something new to learn out there. So I watch a lot of guitar players and, you know, and I mean, female, males, it doesn't matter to me. I just watch it and, and I see a million really amazing players, but their numbers, a lot of them aren't that great. You know, and then you get the Jerry Dines of the world where, you know, he's a really guitar player, but he has that extra something like you're talking about to make right, people yeah. notice him. You know, that's the key to it all, you know, and, and it's it's not just playing, but it never was just playing. If it was just playing, there'd be a million rock stars. You know, it's exactly. never been, you know, it's just completely different now, a completely different right. format. Anyway. You were saying? All right, so circling back to uh, some of the questions on the right-hand side, we're going to start with Alder, because um, this one I think is going to prompt some playing from our guy here. Uh, he says that uh, you enjoy, uh, you seem to enjoy using the major scale in your leads, uh, but are there any exotic scales that you enjoy using? Well, the major scale is a mode. Uh, I actually don't write many songs on a major scale. Uh, you know, so I'm not sure what he means by that. Maybe the positioning that you see uh, I mean, you know, uh, I, I have a degree in music, and what I learned was I think about it a little more cl as a classical artist, for example. 
they called them the church modes. So when you hear, that was the Ionian mode. That wasn't a major scale, you know, and see what I think the, the person is saying is do, you know, you see positionings, but I could play, for example, in the, you know, you would see this. You would see it look, but you're actually the underlying. I could be playing an F Lydian. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you say exotic modes, you can, there's a thing nowadays called synthetic mode. Anybody can make up a scale. See, the way I learned music was this. You had your modes. And the modes were, were the, the classic ones, you know, the Ionian, the Dorian, the Phrygian, the Lydian, Mixolydian, the Aeolian, the Locrian, and then back to the, uh, and the major scale was established because it resolves. The modes really don't resolve. You know, most modes don't. And, and so, but the major scale does. So. When somebody says exotic, you could say, okay, I take the monic minor. But then if I start yeah. on the on the fifth scale degree, so is that exotic? It's the Spanish Phrygian mode or the Phrygian dominant. But see, we looked at it a little differently. We didn't look at learning a million different scales. We looked at modes and then passing tones and chromatic passing tones and see what i do is i use chromatics a lot and so exotic mode like uh i can come up with my own uh synthetic scale calling it the pandemic mode <laughs> i hate the way it sounds <laughs> i can make up anything and so but but i think of it is is in classic modal like literally church modes and and with with chromatic so like a lot of things i'll do is this like, you know so what i'll do is i'll find wide finger stretches with really weird intervals so is it a mode no but there are chromatic tones within whatever key i'm playing so that's how i think about it that's a really good question but i don't really play in major scales unless the solo is in a major key. I just play the key. So whatever the key is, doesn't matter to me. You know, so but that's a really good question. Cool. Alder, thanks for that question, man. I hope that I hope that was answered for you. Um let's hit up Ryan on the next one. It says, who are the most original players you listen to today? And uh, I would imagine maybe an, an interpretation of that would be who do you listen to today who stands out to you the most as an original player, meaning, you know, not doing the same I thing think, everybody else is doing. No, there, there's some really, really great players. And there's so many of them. I don't know the names of everybody. For example, so many, yeah. the, the one kid, he's only 20 or 21 that did that tapping, ver that acoustic version of Cashmere. That blew my mind. You know, and so... uh also, uh, there was a guitarist from Brazil, and he uh, he just went offline. Like he kind of, he kind of like overloaded during COVID. Uh, there, I, I can tell you, there are so many great ones because you could always say, "Oh, Andy James," you know, because he's a finger death punch now, and he's a really great guitar player. Uh, mm -hmm. But he's, you know, the there's some really mind blowing young players out there, and I wish I could give you the name afterwards. I could. I could go to my Instagram list and write down the names. Because, I mean, I've seen guitar players, they use two fingers like a bass player, that are just tearing it up. Or, you know, oh, just, know, yeah. you know it's just so unbelievable. Uh, and, and I could probably name two dozen that I watch. I, I have to say, I don't remember all names. Plus, there's a lot of really hot men out there, too, that are tearing it up, too, you know. I mean, they, they play really great and they dress really cool. And so... There's too many names, but, <laughs> yes. but but I watch like people who are really into like rhythmic playing, the tapping, uh, you know, and, and obviously the shredders, but there's so much more now that people do with guitar and so much tapping. Tapping is like the key to it, you know, and uh, uh, so many people tap now way more than when I was growing up. Tapping wasn't, you know, it was, and when people, it was like Eddie Van Halen, that was simple, simplified tapping. It's nothing right. like that now. 
But I hope that answers that. I I wish I could say more names, but I promise you I could give a list of people talking about. I just can't remember the names. I I watch probably an hour or two hours of original guitar videos a day just watching new players. You know, I'm really into it. Definitely. Definitely. Okay, I like this one because it kind of really points towards Sawtooth. Uh, It says you, you have a signature guitar. And uh, what kind of pickups are you using for whatever Sawtooth guitars, you know, you're creating in collaboration and what draws you to use those pickups? Well, I liked passive pickups more than active. And, you know, I love EMGs. But the thing about EMG for a person that's not, quote, a known guitar player like I am that has a sound, an EMG will make always sound good. So, you know, because a lot of playing, you know, the tone is in your hands, you know, I mean, just like a voice, you know, a voice, and, but the voice of guitar, you need a good instrument, but some of it is just the way you hold a guitar pick or the way you position your fingers. EMG pickups always sound like EMGs. You're not going to sound bad, but unless you're Zach Wilde, you're not going to sound like you. Uh, it's very difficult to get your tone with that active out pickup you know and it's right. like fifth gear you know boom. and so what the pickups that i generally liked were passive and i i was a big fan of duncan and but when i started using seven strings active seemed better i don't really like passive pickups for seven strings it just doesn't seem to work for me so what we did with sawtooth is uh we used fishman fluence pickups and they are amazing and so, like, I have a, a whole line of signature guitars now, uh, seven string with Fishman Fluence. I really love those pickups uh, because right. you can get past in active mode on them, but they sound warm. Like, an, like a passive pickup to me is, is more expressive. It's got more dynamics where, like, an active is like, whoa, all the time, you know? Right. And, and so, but Fishman Fluence have both. They've kind of fixed that. Uh, so I like Duncan's. Um, what we do in Sawtooth is there's varying models. So you could get it uh, in in the basic form with the Sawtooth pickups, which sound really good. They're about 12K. You know, they're right in the league. You know, they, the tolerances are really close to a Duncan and they sound good. Um, or you can do the upgrades and get Duncan pickups put in. So, but I would say the two pickup brands that I like are, are Duncan's and I like uh, Fishman Fluence. And Fishman pickups. Awesome. Awesome. I think we can all agree on that one. Um, here's a good question for a beginner. Do you recommend numerous guitars uh, and shapes, or do you just start with one and stick with one style all the way through? Well, you're talking to a guy that has 175 plus guitars. So, cars, <laughs> numerous guitars. I'm only asking the wrong guy for that one. You only get one <laughs> yeah. answer. But. Why, why have one when you can have a dozen? And uh, you know, more is more, you know, uh, not less more, more is more. And, right. uh, but I think to start, uh, one of the things that that Sawtooth really did that I think they did better than everybody else, and I was reading an article just this morning, because I, I like to keep up with music and what's going on. Like like you said, you're a creator. I didn't, what, what did that, that word didn't even have meaning to me two years ago. Be a creating, yeah. you know what I mean? I, I just, now, uh, you know, you have to, get, it's like a playthrough. You know, nobody called them playthroughs. You know, it's like they were know, just guitar oh, videos. Yeah, yeah, guitar. It's like this is me playing this song. That's Here right. Go, but, yeah, you know. yeah. So you know, I really like the fact that you know we've honed it into a science, and it's only taken about a year. Uh, but uh, read read that question again for me, please. Sorry, I was I was digressing here. What was? Um, it says for beginners. Do you? Oh yeah, beginners. That's right. Guitars and I, next shapes, or just stick with one style. I have to apologize. I went out that creator thing. We had to, we went through hoops to become a creator. So I was kind of thinking in my head about what we had to do to get it. Uh, I think uh, with Sawtooth, what they did was, and I was reading the article today about how many people have taken guitar since COVID hit. It's like through the roof. And see, a lot of companies, they weren't prepared for this, where Sawtooth is always prepared. I mean, I have to give credit. They, you know, they, they make really good entry level guitars that are real guitars. They're 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 real instruments, and and they play really good, and, and they sound really good. So to answer that person's question, you just need one to start with. But if you're going to record music and you really want to put yourself out there, you need more than one because not every guitar is going to fit every musical 
circumstance. Exactly. You know, so you're going to need more. But, you know, I mean, I said, why well, have one when I can play two? You know what I mean? And, and I came up with the double, but I learned on one. And uh, but Sawtooth makes great guitars like that. In fact, uh, people at, at uh, they were talking about that a lot of companies were not prepared in that entry level market like Sawtooth was, that so many kids are playing guitars now. And, you know, adults all ages, but guitars exploded. It's, it really exploded. It's great. Nice. Definitely. I, I can agree with that. Um, one, uh, we're going to hit on this one just because it's a little different than the other questions. It's what speakers uh, do you use in your Sawtooth amps? Well, there's two. One, they have the stock uh, speakers come with those amps that aren't a name brand. But also we have a new signature model. Uh, they make really great tube amps. It's in the back there, but it's a Celestian. So I, I'm a Celestian fan. I like greenbacks and vintage 30s. And so Sawtooth put those in, in the amps. I think it's a, a vintage 30 that's in this. Uh, it's really high-end tube and sounds amazing. But yeah, I would say if you're going to go for a speaker, especially for rock and metal, you can't go wrong with Celestia. They have this tight sound that it, it just, they sound better, in my opinion, than other ones. And that's what we have in the Sawtooth. Cool. Cool. By the way, everybody asking questions, I'm going to do the best I can to make sure I hit every single one. If I miss it, I, I apologize. I'm going to do the best I can to crunch these all together, make sure they all get answered. I'm not going to skip any one intentionally. I think we can kill two birds with one stone on this one. Uh, we had one asking what your opinion was on the uh, on the Duncan JB pickup, and another one asking what your, uh, I think you kind of already answered this, but we can elaborate a little more, uh, how you compare the sound between the Fishman and the EMG pickups. Okay, the Duncan JB, JB stands for Duff Beck. Uh, I love that pickup. Uh, I really see the thing I like about Duncan is that you can, uh, it, it's so expressive and there's a, it's a rich sound, but the Duncan GB, like on the grand scheme of things, it's a super loud pickup, but it's a, it's a killer. So I love that. That's one of my favorite Duncan ones, the JB. Now, uh, how I compare Fishman to EMG, I have to say, the EMG 707s, though, you know, I had those on one of my seven string guitars. Though that was my favorite pickup. And I was told, oh no, those are just like the uh, you know, the 85 and the 81s. And, you know, in other words, the six string, they didn't sound right. like it to me. And not at all. The 707s were really good. The Fishman Fluence, in my opinion, is way superior in one way. It's got more dynamics. See, okay. the the EMGs are just here's the EMG. Whoa! You know, I mean, right, that's right. EMG. It's full on all the time. Where I want to be full on. You know, there's sometimes you know you want to. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, some. But then there's other times. Where... You know, so and the Fishman fluence does that it, it gives you the dynamics of a passive pickup and it also you can voice it so you can it's it's you can actually do different voicings within the pickup whoever designed it was had it going on you know i like emg so don't get me wrong i'm not criticizing them i'm just saying in my opinion what they what they are you know i mean they're full on and but 707 was really good seven string but i would take a fishman any day because a lot of my EMG guitars that I had, I and, and again, I don't mind the company, but I swapped the, uh, the active system for passive. I put Duncan's in because I like it better. Nice. Cool, guys. I hope that answered that question for you guys. I'm going to move on to this question from George Robbins because I think it's an awesome question. I definitely want to know the answer to this too, especially from your perspective. Uh, do you think that shred guitar, and obviously specifically shred guitar, has reached its pinnacle at this point? Or do you think that there's uh, new players that are going to innovate this and take it, you know, take it further that's a really great question i'm going to answer it from my music theory and music music theory and musical historical background when mozart was alive in the 1700s it, it was in the classic era after bach. so bach was there in vivaldi then mozart and haydn uh were, were now the idea of classic music classical was changed See, Baroque was really like, they called it unity of affection, AFF. And it meant the atmosphere from beginning to end had to be the same. If it was sad, it had to be sad. Beginning, if it was happy. The classic era was different. It was all change. 
And so at, by the time the 1700s rolled around, this is, has a direct correlation to the answer. There were over 10,000 symphonies written. And at that time, all the music critics said, everything that can be done has already been done. And you're like, really? Because you that, probably know it's like had, milk. <laughs> yeah. So to answer this person's question, I remember being signed to Shrapnel Records in the 80s. Uh, Mike Varney, who was signed to Shrapnel Ingve, Greg Howe, Tony McAlpine, John Five, Paul Gilbert, Marty Friedman. The list goes. It, in other words, if you were on Shrapnel, you were like, I'm bad, dude. And, you know, it was. And so, modern, yeah. and, and, you know, Mike and I had mentioned that we said, after Ingve and people like me and all this, what can be done? look what's done today so i guarantee you I, i'm so happy because i really wanted to help guitar players and my goal was to show my techniques to to people and and so they could start and learn and i and i'm one of them i mean i you know i've been noted as that one of the the, the most influential electric guitar teachers uh there was a thing in guitar world magazine in the top three and and I, it's not to brag but it's going to be unlimited we think today we see all this amazing stuff. Well, it was the same when I was coming out. When I was so much faster than anybody else, people are like, but dude, man, you know, you know, oh, oh, this is playing fast. And then you listen back now, there were a lot of melodies. It was just mind blowing to that generation. Now these younger players are mind blowing now, but they're going to be older in 20 years, and the that younger generation will come and do things we don't even know. So it never ends there's always going to be something new and that's what i'm concerned about definitely that's that's a that's an awesome answer man thank you for elaborating on that that's something i would have asked so that was a really cool question <laughs> uh let's hit arlo's question right here he says we're three months into 2021 what other surprises can we expect from mab the rest of this year well i released a record last year called more machine than man i had chris adler on drums from Lamb of God. I had Victor Chris Wooten. Adler's amazing. Yeah. Oh, great. And, and I had Victor Wooten, a you know, five-time Grammy Award Bay winner. Player. Yeah, he played on the record. Uh, and I, I didn't get a chance to tour for it at all. So what's going on now in 2021 is, you know, I have 15 solo albums out that are basically in the shred, prog rock, you know, you know, stun guitar genre. And, and, and uh, I, you know, it, it gets to the point where I kind of see what I've had to say and, you know, and that doesn't mean I'm not going to play that style anymore. But right now, for example, with Sawtooth, one of the owners is a great drummer. Kevin, one of the other uh, owners, a really good, great singer. And so we, we, we created this MAB band and it's kind of like, and we have a really good bass player. Uh, he, he looks really cool, plays great, but he sounds like Stink from the police. He's got that really high voice. So we've mm -hmm. got these great vocals and, and I can sing background. So we've got singers in the band. And, and uh, so I'm doing a lot of music people wouldn't expect right now. Like uh, I'm playing a lot of acoustic guitar. Uh, we're doing covers like, you know, Tom Morello was my student. So we do that song from Audio Slave, uh, Like a Stone. I love right. that song. Amazing and then we'll song. do a, we'll do a Skinner songs. We'll do uh, The Doors. And I get to totally riff out in a different uh in a different musical context so uh and then i also did a show with uh with uh, rudy sarzo on bass and uh vinnie apice on drums so you know white snake ozzy and then black sabbath and you know and then we used a, a 19 year old girl singer uh named melody christia she's in a band called lilia she's like a female ronnie james Dio. this wow. america's got talent man lilia they blew she's like Wah! You know, it's like unbelievable. It's like the soul of Janis Joplin and Ronnie James Dio and a 19 year old. Uh, it's amazing. So we're seeing that concert. So I have a lot of things going on uh, this year, it, but it's more going to be based on like live performances filmed and released. And then later this year, I've got a five week tour of Europe. I'm hoping to go and I'm supposed to go on tour in the United States starting September. Uh, and we'll just see those I, we can't guarantee, but the, but you know, the content we can. So that's what, what we're doing right now. You know, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of it's through Sawtooth that, uh, that we're doing concerts and things 
you know, based on the, the people there. And, and, and I get to do all kinds of music. I mean, it's really fun for me, you know, playing acoustic, uh, you know, doing that, you know, that the percussive acoustic style or ripping on an acoustic versus just playing electric and in, in like a shred genre. Right. Cool. I, uh, Rick, I, I'm going to bear with me here. You have like five questions, so I'm going to take two of them out so that way we can get questions fielded out from everybody. Uh, but this one's kind of the same thing. I think we already touched on it. But uh, what young guitar players are you watching? And uh, are there any, you know, young female guitar player that you're kind of keeping your eye on that's really kind of, you know, making a name for themselves right now? Well, you know, there are a lot of British. It seems like a lot of these females are from England. But there's a girl from, I think she's from Argentina. See, you know, I, I, I'm terrible with this. I don't know the names of everybody. And what I do is I follow them on Instagram. Uh, there are uh, there are three female guitar players now that are absolutely mind blowing. I mean, we're talking that you shred your face off, and, and uh, you know, some of them played like some of my songs and uh, like my versions of songs. And my most technical things are just pulling it off like a guy would do it, you know, or, you know, right. easily. And, and uh, it it's really great. I, again, I will I, if you guys want. I promise I'll do this. I'll make a list. I'll put the guys, the girls there, because there's three right now that I can, I just can't think of the names. I think one of them is named Alyssa, but it's not the ones you would think of, like the Sophie. There's Sophie two Bro, Sophies. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're really good, you know. They're really cute. Part of it is their image, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, they've, and, and look at more power to them. Uh, you know, I'm not taking, but there are some of these women out there that are just, they're cute, but they're like, Time to rip some faces off. And, and I mean, seriously amazing. And, and uh, there's three of them. I can one I see on Facebook and I, and I follow them, you know, so it's it's not. Uh, but I, you know, I just watch the videos and, you know, a lot of them are short now. So it's great. You know, you have 15 <laughs> seconds on TikTok or, you know, 45 seconds to a minute on Instagram. So I watch a lot of them. But I promise I'll make a list of the new guitar players that I love. Awesome. Cool. Moving on to moving on to Greg's question. This one's a really good question, I think. Uh, any advice for guitar players stuck in a developmental rut? What's your advice for those of us that need to get over the mediocrity hump? Writers. I follow that question. That's a great question, Greg. Okay, writer's block. Now that that the old school term was writer's block. That right. and here's what I learned. Again, I'm going to defer back to my music education. I learned a lot from the past because. I learned about a 21-year-old guitarist in the 1930s named Charlie Christian. You know, that was the first electric guitarist. Uh, the internet has been great for looking back because my dad used to have a great saying, don't re reinvent the wheel. If you don't know what came before you, you're going to make the same mistakes as the 20-year-old in the year 1911. And so, you know, it's good to know the past because you don't want to make the mistakes of the past and can, and you can start by knowing what they know. So here's what, what I can say um, as far as, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, you're gonna have to repeat the question again. I'm sorry, the second time I've done this. Uh, say that question one time. Uh, it, the gist of it is basically, you know, what advice can you give to us guitar okay. players who are stuck okay. in the Okay, I'm sorry, I, I do, I'm a little, uh, I don't know why, I mean, oh, okay, I don't drink. Okay, but here's the thing about, you know what happens? My mind starts thinking about all this information I have in my head. It's like, I got to reboot <laughs> every once in a while. Johan, uh, Mozart never had writer's block in his life. He could take, it just came, it was like, it was almost like this intelligence that came from somewhere otherworldly. It would get into his head, he would just write it down. No mistakes, no rewrites, no anything. Beethoven had to rewrite. Uh, during Mozart's time, uh, there was a composer named Verdi. Now, Verdi was a lot older than Mozart, and Verdi was an amazing composer, but he had severe writer's block and used to pray to do this. Now, I'm not talking religion or politics. I never go there. But what I'm saying is he tried to figure out how to how to combat writer's block. So I studied people who never had writer's block and people who did. Here's what I do. This is one of the best pieces of advice for me. When I get it, like, I don't ever have writer's block because here's my secret to it. Drums, loops. 
if, if I'm, I have like this Mondo setup on my computer, you know, MIDI files from everybody from Chris Adler, you know, to jazz and funk stuff and mixers, I will put, or I'll listen to uh, a playlist and I'll copy beats. Because see, one of the things that separates great songwriters from mediocre is the rhythm of what they do. Okay, I mean, if you... Or, or like, right. it, and so most enter songwriters. I love you. Oh, I love you. They, they have no beat. They have groove. So what I do is I never use a metronome. I've got a classical metronome that's over there. It goes up to about two oh four BPM. It's called Presto because they use the Italian word. So and. and for that's not that fast in today's world. 204 is like in the shred zone, but not really super fast. Get beats, listen to grooves. And then what I'll do is I'll find a MIDI groove or I'll even program. I'm a good drum programmer because I can play drums. And so I'll like, and so, and then just. <laughs> And I'll start jamming along to it. If I don't like the beat, I'll change it. But it is amazing when you start with the idea of a beat. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, like uh, I have this song uh, from my new album called The Badlands. And I, I came up with the do, 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 like. <laughs> It's just grooving. And I, you know, I had, you know, low B and you know, drop down to a low A and, and then, you know, actually A flat. But I, I came up with this idea. I was listening. Uh, they call it active rock, which is the new rock, you know, uh, you know, bands like Five Finger Death Punch and all that. And I right. was hearing like, do, 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 boom, do, 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 boom. And so what I did is I took out my phone. I just recorded it. And I went back and listened to it. I'm like, I record hundreds of messages. And, and like uh, Michael Amott from Arch Enemy goes, why do you record audio? Do the video. He goes, don't you have to relearn it? I'm like, you're right. And, and so I record videos for myself. But I'll sit in my car and go, doo -doo 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 I'll just tap out something if I'm stopped at a light. I'll record it. But it's grooves. If you get into a lot, play a groove, but also do something too. Learn something new. Go online. Just find a riff. It could be a country riff. It could be anything. First, your mind away from the rut. And, and it could right. be, but that, that's what I do. And it works. I do not have writer's block. I've written a lot of music in my life. If somebody said today, I want you to record a piece in this style and do in whatever amount of time, I know I could do it. You know, I would reference a few things out. I would listen. And then, and then I just go to work. You don't just create it in my mind. You know, the, the notation of the past is to, is what, what we use as DOS systems. We don't write the past, but in many ways it is like the past because we're still recording our ideas. Mozart had to record an idea on a piece of paper. We just record it on a DOS system or a phone. Same right. idea, just different technology. It's a great question. Cool. All right. Well, I mean, we're all taking away a ton of really good information from the master here today. So thank you for that question, man. That was awesome. Um, next question. Uh, it was from up there a little while ago. Do you have a favorite pedal that you like to use? I do. Uh, I awesome. like two favorite pedals. Uh, the, the types are, are overdrive and delay. And what I always, I have a signature overdrive pedal, but you know, when I was growing up, amps did not have master volumes. There was one sound on, on, on an amp clean and when right. i and i was like i can't go i can't play iron man with a clean sound you know right. i mean you know i'm not in a country band and so and then only pedal available is a fuzz or a distortion right. i was like ah these suck i hated the sound i could never get a good sound 
had an amp with a, with a fuzz. They literally called them fuzz. I'm like, yeah, fuzz. I, I dust fuzz, you know? And so, <laughs> you know, I mean, fuzz sucks. And so, you know, unless you went on retro, but uh, what the big change for me, and I was uh, a teenager when this happened, the master volume became part of amplifier. So you could overdrive the amp. And then they came out with a thing called an overdriver. Overdrivers, not distortion, just kind of boost that grit signal. Like I love the British word for it, filth. They call it mm-hmm. filth. And, and and so the overdriver pedal to me is the most significant thing for my sound because it means I don't have to overdrive the amp to the max, which means I can almost have like three sounds. Now, right now, you don't get a quick sound. Let's see, I can have. It's kind of overdriven, but then I can hit the overdriver and have a metal tone, and I can roll down the volume and almost get a clean sound. So that's my favorite pedal. Second is delay. Uh, I think every lead sound, like I, I was talking uh, to one of my famous guitar friends that came up in the 90s in the grunge era where they didn't play any solos. He actually didn't even know where a delay should be placed in a signal chain. It's like, kidding me? And, and, but I showed him. I'm not going to mention the name. He's really famous. And, and, uh, but what I did is I said, dude, you always put spatial effects, a, a loop. You want to, because if you put through a chain like an overdrive, I said, you're going to cloud up the, the, the delay. I said, so if you want delay or reverb or something, you know, like a, a reverb pedal, not from there, you put it through the effects, uh, those spatial effects. And so, but that's what I use. I use a delay through the effects loop. And because it gives you fullness, you know, that ambience. And, and I use an overdrive. Then I like a lot of things. Uh, I never use Waz that much. I always thought, you know, if you use a watch too much, it's kind of, what are you hiding? <laughs> you know, with that big treble boost and then it dips down into that frequency and it hides <laughs> all this noise. Yeah, I think that's one of the main criticisms of everybody, but. Yeah. You but know, that, effects, you know, effects have always been some like somewhat of a mystery. Uh, I mean, I'm 36 now, but when I started playing guitar, I was 13. And back then is when uh, like Kill Switch Engage was, was first coming out and then they were right. getting these insane metal tones, right? And we, we all had practice amps, so we all had your PV-158, you know, uh, your Rage 158s and stuff. And I'm sitting there and I'm buying metal zone pedals and I'm buying anything I can. I'm like, dude, where is this Where is this tone coming from? How do they have this tone? Anybody else that I had that played guitar as a friend asking the same question. It took us forever, years to realize that it was a really good solid amp with an overdrive in front of it that was giving him that tone. That's right. And, and, and then, until I started yeah. recording in DAWs, I didn't know where the delay went. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And then, and then, you know, and then they use a... Uh, uh, you know, for clean sounds, you want a compressor a lot of times, you know, and, and, and some delay, but they also gated it. That's the thing, too. But, um, do you needed some kind of gate or a noise suppressor? Uh, you know, because what I used to do, I, I used to hate that. I had to roll down the volume so much to go. Because if you have too much overdrive, it's going to go. Yeah. <laughs> And so right. you need that, you know, you need that gate too. You need to, to let the sound down a little bit. But uh, yeah, it's an overdriver, a huge difference for me, a huge difference. Because those, uh, like the distortion pedals, it just sounded too fuzzy to me. It didn't, I don't know, it didn't sound natural. It just, if I want to emulate a sound from like the 1960s or something, then I would use a fuzz. But I don't right. emulate those sounds, so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, this one's from Phil, uh, what is the hardest part? Uh, what is the hardest guitar part for a song from the days of Nitro? They're all hard. <laughs> They're uh, all difficult. Uh, we uh, we were uh, billed as the highest, fastest, and the loudest. Now we came. Nitros came in at the very tail end of the '80s. So you know, White Snake and Motley Crue and Poison and all these bands had already been big. Then at the tail, because our tours really were in the 90s, were considered an eight man because, uh, you know, when I when we played, this is a funny story, but it's absolutely true. Our singer was 19 when we did our first album. And, and so I'm in the studio, it's called OFR, Out Effing Rage. And I'm playing a song 
uh, the solo to a song called Shot Heard Around the World. It was really simple song, but just... And then... And then I'm doing those palm mutes, but it's slower. Like, but everybody around the world, I'm ready to rock, baby. You know, very 80s, you know, doom, doom, doom. But then it got to the solo, and I was like, you know, you know, like the guy is saying, using the major scale, right? I was actually, you know, major pentatonic at the time. The president of our record company comes in, Bob Cahill, and it was so, he was a great guy. He ended up discovering like Vanilla Ice and all these other bands. And, but, <laughs> oh, wow. You know, he comes in with the long hair and a ponytail. Like if you see like the typical 80s executive trying to be hit, you know, with the hair, like this much hair and a ponytail, everybody else's hair down here, you know, rocked out like, like, you know, like, like we stuck our fingers in a socket and our hair exploded. And so he comes in the studio and he's like, Angelo, I thought you were fast. He goes, play me some fast S-H-I-T. I'm like, what? And he goes, he goes, I want you to do something on this record, Angelo. He was like, Angelo, I, what? He goes, I want you to overplay all the time. I go, are you kidding me? So I was going to like, whoa. Going back to our apartment, you know, in LA, we lived in Woodland Hills, me and Jason. I'm like, whoa. So when somebody asks, Every solo was fast. Every single solo. And I went crazy. I mean, I, I had 36 fret guitars, seven string guitars, uh, 29 fret guitars. I used every fret you can imagine and added some of my own. So, you know, one of the songs uh, was called Machine Gunetti. And so it was a thrashy too. Like... And then they had that. You know, that beat. Right. There was a really cool section. Sorry, I don't know if I'm 100% in tune here. We just decided to use a guitar. A couple of yeah, that D is just a little bit sharp. Okay, it was a little sharp. Okay, but it was like. like the marsh everybody's marshing and two seconds later you know so then it's just full shred every right. song was full shred every song and the tempos were like insane you know so we're up to you know back then you know 210 220 230 240 you know so it's like Whoa! and uh so every song on that first album is super hard to play. Every song. Now, Freight Train is one that it was so fast, but almost every note was worked out. See, I always had, like, when I do those, I always have a beginning and an end, maybe even sometimes a middle. But I like to improvise, too. I don't like to work everything out. It sounds too stiff for me. And, and uh, But some solos I work out the way, like the solo in Freight Train. And it's 200 BPM. So back then, hardly anybody could play it. Right. But now a lot of people can play it. And it's been a lot of uh, playthroughs with young guitar player playing my solo note for note. But that's one of the really hard ones. And one of the things we did in Nitro, too, though, they're not static keys, you know, or static tempos even. Our, um, our tempos move. When, when I wrote click tracks for the band, it was not a static tempo, meaning like 120 or 127 BP all the way along. It might be 127, 157, you know, 110, 240. Our songs moved organically, and I used that click track to make, like we would have even tempo increments. I was really good at, at uh, programming this stuff. But it was, uh, but the freight train solo, and another thing we did is we always modulated. Uh, we always changed keys during solos. I don't like to just play in one key. And so, because it's kind of, not all the time, but to me, it gets kind of mindless after a while. So always the keys of Nitro songs, they, they changed. It, you know, you might start in D, then it might move down to relative minor E minor. You, you just never know, but I, it was a lot more complex than people thought. But so that's a long answer to the question. <laughs> there we go. Cool. I hope we answered that question for you. Uh, Going to hit a personal question right now. By the way, if you guys have not checked out uh, the MAB YouTube channel, you definitely need to head over there and check it out and watch what he's got coming out. I was wondering what the inspiration was for you making all the tribute videos 
uh, you know, the Eddie Van Halen and the Metallica and the Dimebag and all those. Uh, those were all, by the way, amazing. I love watching those all the time. It was so, such a creative way to pay tribute to those uh, guitar players. What was the inspiration for that, for doing that? Well, thanks. I'm actually releasing Tribute to Randy 2 tomorrow at 12 o'clock California time. Yes. And uh, it, it's a, the inspiration is this. I, I, I think any artist that wants to be big should learn other people's music. I don't know of one really famous guitar player or famous artist that doesn't know songs from other people because you don't know how, if you're standing on stage playing your own song with no groove and nobody's getting into it, then all of a sudden you're a rock band and you play an ACDC song or you play Purple Rain by Prince, the place goes insane. And so you, I think to be a good writer yourself, you have to know the feeling of playing a song that connects with people. And, and so uh, what I did is I grew up playing cover songs. Now, I also am a pro writer. I, I've said I've got 15 solo albums. Three of the records that I did, three of the albums, uh, two of them are tributes because I, I never would make a good tribute band guitar player. Like I cannot stand to play guitar like the artist I'm covering. It, I, I respect, like, I have a saying, I can never be better than Randy Rhodes could be Randy Rhodes. I can't right. do Randy Rhodes better than Randy Rhodes could do Randy Rhodes. I, I can't do, uh, you know, uh, I can't be the uh, Dave Gilmore, everybody, you know, use him or, or, or any new bands. I can't Jeff Loomis from Arch Enemy better than Jeff Loomis can be Jeff Loomis. But Very I can, way to put it, yeah. Yeah, but I can do the best Michelangelo beady of Jeff Loomis that I can do. So I wanted to do tributes in my way because to pay homage to these artists. And and I picked some of the big ones. And I used to like to do medleys. They're not really mashups, they're medleys where I'll take like uh, we used to do this when I was a kid. We would take like one basic song and then put a bunch of riffs from the band's music and I was really good at arranging stuff. And so that's what I did like with Metallica. I tried to keep all the old Jason, not Jason, but the Cliff era, you know, the right. early Metallica. And so I kept the, the kind of, and then I, I know Jason Newstead, not that well, but the singer and Nitro up with him. So I added one of the Jason riffs at the end, you know, Metallica era. Uh, the Eddie Van Halen, I just looked him, you know, talk about me. He was like the happiest guy in metal. It's like, oh, he's, I'm happy, happy, right. happy, you know, and, and I really liked his music. And, you know, it's kind of like Oz Osborne singing crazy, crazy. That's how it go. The nursery rhyme. That's right. in the key of A major. It's like, dee, 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 dee. By the way, the I the Halo one, I thought it was really cool the way you led us to believe that it was going to start with one song and then it stuck and then you switch and it starts with another. That was really cool. I'm sorry to cut you off, but keep going. Oh, thanks. Well, yeah, that's, and the idea was, yeah, to twist and turn on these, you know, and make it your own, you know, because some people said, well, you know, you don't sound like Kirk. Well, no kidding. Only Kirk sounds like Kirk. And I, you know, he's, he likes my guitar. He told me straight up, he told me that he's a fan of mine. I talked to Metallica a couple of years ago. I saw him. He came to one of our shows at the Wiz a few years ago. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so I, I love doing it. And the inspiration is that this music is really great. If, if, if we've learned anything, history's taught me one thing, music history. If a song is good 100 years ago, people really like it. It's usually good today, you know, because you can take away the image. You know, you can, you know because we're always going to laugh at, dude, can you believe what these dudes look like in 2021, man? Can you believe they, you know, or, or, or right. can you believe they had, they had like, like 5g you know you know we're up to 87.7g back you know 20 years from now but you know we will look like dinosaurs to the 20 years from now it always happens and, and so but good is good in any generation and you know that's why like right now rock is killing if you look statistically on playlist you've got hip-hop and pop music and rock is right next to it in England, the top five albums right now in the UK are, are rock albums. Uh, and it's because so many young people are playing music right now, you know, and playthroughs. You know, people used to look down like as at an artist when I would do tracks, just me playing alone to tracks. No one ever claimed I cheated. I never had fast sound in the recordings. Now nobody cares because, 
you see DJs. What's the big deal? One guy up on stage or a guy and a couple of girls or a girl who's spinning records. What's the big deal about one guy on stage playing to some music? As long as right. people aren't stupid, you can tell. If I'm playing like this and then the background, you're <laughs> well, we know he's cheating, you know. Right, and, exactly. And, uh, but uh, so I hope that answers that. That's definitely. The, by the way, uh, to, just to kind of throw back on that, you know, humble, respectful way you were talking about other guitar players. I don't believe anybody can do Michelangelo Badio, Batio the way that, you know. <laughs> Mike does it. So that, I think that you're in that same league of guitar players, and I don't think anybody can do what you do any better than you can. They can well, only thanks. try to do it in their own style. Um, all right, guys, so we're pretty much approaching the hour here. If I didn't get to your question, I, I sincerely apologize. I did my best to get to everybody, but we are going to do this giveaway now, this sawtooth giveaway for this guitar, and uh, let me find out who our winner is. Before I do that, let me show you guys what you will be winning. Of course, that is this sawtooth guitar here. We've got two humbuckers. Awesome looking fretboard with that inlay there. And it is a signed guitar by Mr. Michelangelo Badio himself. So the winner of this guitar is going to be, uh, let me do a, a drum roll here. But it's like the best drum roll I can do right now. <laughs> there we go, we got a better one. David Ferguson from Elkhart, Indiana. David Ferguson, we are gonna reach out to you via email and uh, they'll give you further details on how you can claim this bad boy. But uh, this signed MAB guitar is all yours. Cool. Sawtooth. Cool, man. Awesome. Super stoked for you, dude. You can have a really good time playing this thing. It it feels absolutely amazing. It feels light. It feels like it's going to play it like butter. You're going to love this thing. Thank you guys so much for joining us for this live stream today. Thank you so much, Michael, for being here, man. This was really awesome. Thank you for taking the time. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. You know, I love Pitbull music. And I, I did a clinic there some years ago, you know, so it's just it's a great place. I want to thank Sawtooth Guitars for being in the comment section the whole time. They were answering everybody's technical questions about the guitars so that we didn't have to. I, want, I appreciate that. You guys were on it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys for all the questions and for being here with us. We will catch you guys uh, on the next one. Mike, take care, man. Thank you. Abel, thanks. Pitbull Audio Rules. Thank Pitbull you. Pitbull Audio Rules, guys. We're out. Yeah. Okay.